much of what a computer can do depends upon what its CPU, the central processing unit can do. And what a central processing unit can do depends upon what instructions it can execute. The set of instructions that a CPU can execute is called instruction set of the CPU or of the machine. The user view the instruction set as a definition of the machine. The designer view the instruction set as a functional requirement for the machine. Today, let us study the instruction set. Let us come to the the program that we shown on the first day, okay, a high level code uh, where we have written only three lines of code, read x, y, z equal to x plus y and print z, okay. As I told that these statements will somewhat vary from programming language to programming language. Now, as I said, that this high level language code cannot be executed directly by the machine and therefore it is translated first into an assembly language code where the read x is converted into assembly language statement that in a input statement which reads uh, an input into the accumulator we are thinking of in terms of a accumulator based machine okay and then that uh, it has to be stored in to the location x now it is stored accumulator x similarly in and stored accumulator y for reading y now this is a computation that is done since it is an accumulator based machine the first x has to be loaded into the accumulator by this instruction load a accumulator x then I say that at memory y, that means content of y has to be added to the accumulator and then content of the accumulator has to be stored into the location z by means of a store accumulator z and print z is basically out. We have assumed that only one input device is there and one output device is there. Now I have shown this that assembly language statement but the assembly language itself once more cannot be executed by the computer, the central processing unit. It is further has to be translated into what we call that machine language code. Now this is the machine language code we have written in hexadecimal notation. For example, in has a code of 0, 01, okay, which essentially means this is hexadecimal 0, 01. The code actually is so 0, 0, 0, 0, then 0, 0, 0, 1. This is 0, this is 1 in hexadecimal. We have written this for our ease of writing, okay? Now, similarly, stored accumulator, the instruction is 0, 4, and the address of x has to be specified in that, and therefore the address of space we have spe specified to be 0, 5, 0, 0. This also in hexadecimal, we have... Uh, given all of them in hexadecimal notations, okay? Now this is address of x. Now you see that essentially some, a high level language statement like this or this is ultimately converted into machine language form, zero, zeros in terms of zeros and ones, okay? And it is executed. The correspondingly we have an assembly language, right? This is for human consumption. For example, this is for human use, this is also for ease of writing programs in almost machine language, we call it the assembly language. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between assembly language statement and a machine language statement, okay? Therefore, when we will discuss that instruction set, instead of directly using machine language code, we'll, be dis we'll discuss in terms of somewhat assembly language code Assembly language code is nothing but a symbolic mnemonic representation of the machine language code, almost code for code, okay? Now why I have shown this is this, that you see that every instruction, okay, right, has an instruction format, right? For example, this particular machine, that instruction format for storing an accumulator X is 
STX, okay, I mean assembly language code is STX and that instruction format is say 04 and 0500, okay, this is the instruction format in the machine language for this STAX code. Now if we examine it, you see that it can be divided into the instruction, machine instruction can be divided into two parts. One is the operation that has to be done and we call it op code, okay? And another part is that with what the operation has to be done, we call it operand address, okay. Therefore, one part is op code and other part is the address, okay. Now, uh, depending upon the machine, this instruction format as we call it, this instruction format varies. For example, the, uh, the machine that you're considering is a single address machine, so to say, which means an instruction can have at most one address, okay? For example, this doesn't need an address. This has one address. This doesn't need an address. This has one address, okay? Therefore, we call it a single instruction single address instruction. Similarly, we can have say double address instruction or triple address instruction. For example, that a double address instruction may take this form that add say x y that means you add the content of x to the content of y and then leave the content leave the address uh, leave the result of addition into y that is a double address instruction okay similarly a triple address instruction can be say add z okay sorry add z y x that means you just add y with x and then store the result into z we call such a instruction a triple address instruction now depending upon the machine that uh, machine can be a single address it can be double address and it can be triple address also though the double address is more prevalent okay now as you can naturally assume that if we have a single address instruction, there should be some zero address instruction also. Well, there are. When I say that it's a single address machine, instruction machine, it means that at most that can be one address, okay? Therefore, it can have some zero address machine as well, okay? Zero address instruction as well. Similarly, a double address instruction machine can have a single address instruction and zero address instruction also. So for triple address, that it can have double address instruction, it can have single address instruction, it can have zero address instruction also, okay? And apart from this that we can somehow and sometimes manage the operands in such a way that we don't need to specify the addresses to compute something. We'll come to that discussion later. Now, therefore, when I call that instruction format, I say that it has an operand address. If it's a double address, there will be two more operands here. Okay, uh, sorry, one more operand here right, say operand two, and if we have a triple address machine, then we can have, we'll have another operand, which is operand three over here. 
and this is the opcode. Now, one important thing, so far as that instruction format is concerned, is that how lengthy will be an instruction, okay? Naturally, it depends upon the number of operands that you use, okay? And also, the size of the opcode and the addressing scheme, okay, that you use here, here, and here, okay? That means the addressing scheme that you, uh, and that the computer uses. Now, naturally, the size of the opcode will be dependent upon the size of the opcode will be dependent upon one factor is that if n is the number of instructions that you have to uh, uh, you have to implement, then the size should be at least log 2 of n upper bound of it, okay, naturally. And it should also, the opcode size should also, the opcode size here we have shown to be one byte only, the opcode size also will be dependent upon that uh, what way you use opcode. That means sometimes that the way of specifying the address, so for example, way of specifying the addresses here is totally independent of the what operation that instruction does, okay? In such a case, we call that it is an orthogonal instruction set, okay? Orthogonal. That orthogonal instruction set, as I said, that it is essentially the way of specifying the addresses of the operands is independent of the opcode, okay? For any opcode, you can use any kind of operands, okay? In that case, we call it an orthogonal one. If it's an orthogonal instruction set, then the opcode may be somewhat less, okay? And in such cases, the opcode can be of fixed length, right? But if the opcode also specifies, the opcode has to specify it, include where the instruct where the operands are, in that case the opcodes are generally of varying length. Okay, therefore that instruction opcode can be of fixed length, can be of varying length, depending upon that how the machine instruction and decoding has been designed. Okay. Once more we'll have some little more discussion about it later. Another important factor of the length of opcode and the length of instruction is that the word size. Okay, we know that uh, the minimum unit, addressable unit of the computer is byte. Now, two or say four bytes is taken together and is formed a word. Okay, and generally an instruction will be I mean, uh, and word will be an integral multiple of an instruction or an instruction can be an integ integral multiple of word, okay? That way, that instruction set size, sorry, instruction length is decided. And the designer takes all these uh, issues into consideration when they design an instruction set. Now, let us, uh, after we have come to that person instruction format, that it has two parts, one is that opcode part, and another is that uh, operand part, okay? Let us see first the opcode part of it. Essentially, we'll see that what operation a computer uh, can perform and the CPU can perform or generally performs, okay? Now, uh, the total instructions are of various in nature and generally are grouped together okay, under different heads, okay? Let us go uh, head by head okay and give some examples of the instructions that a computer performs okay first naturally is uh, that uh, uh, data movement instructions right we call it say so first group is data
data transfer group. Okay. Essentially, this moves data from one point to another point. Okay. Now, as I said earlier also that the computer in the CPU, there are some general purpose registers okay, and the data has to be moved from memory to the inside of the CPU, that means in some register within the CPU and data has to be moved from register to register also. Okay. The codes generally are of the form that say, we can say say move say from register 1 to register 2, that means we move the data from register 1 to register 2. I am using a two address machine okay, to give examples. Okay. Uh, naturally, the single address machines or the triple address machines almost follow uh, the almost the same set of instructions, only the addressing will change, that we will talk about later on. Okay, The move can be from a register to register, it can be from memory to a register, it can be from register to register and it can be from memory to memory. Now for the data transfer group, okay, now takes care of such transference of data from register to register, memory to register, register to memory and memory to memory. Not that all of uh, them have to be there in all the uh, machines. Okay. For example, that in the case of a single address instruction, that memory to memory, that movement is not there. In that case, one has to move the data from a memory to a register and then from a say memory one to a register and then from register to memory two that way. But the move data from one point to another is a very important instruction that has to be there in some form or other in every machine. For example, but instead of move, some machine can also say transfer, say TSR. I am talking that this is the assembly language, corresponding machine language code will exist. Therefore, we talk in terms of assembly language only. Sometimes there are what we call that exchange instructions is there. So, for example, if you say that exchange R1, R2, okay, that means data between R2 and R1 is exchanged. That also falls under that data transfer group. Okay. Now, that's our data transfer group. Let us see what other groups we have. Say two, it is another important group of instructions, say arithmetic group, right? In this arithmetic group, actually all addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all of these instructions should be included, right? Now this addition, subtraction, multiplication that can be done on integers, that can be done on floating points also, okay. Naturally, that instruction set also will be dependent upon what are the data types that are supported in a computer. The general data types that are supported in a computer, as we know already, that it is integer, floating point, it can be character or it can be logical data also, okay. Now, say the arithmetic group, therefore, can have add, that means adding two numbers, subtract, Okay, multiply, divide. Okay, these are basic operations say on integers. Then on floating point, it can be say floating point add, floating point subtract, say floating point multiply, and floating point divide. That works on floating point. Operands okay, and uses the floating point arithmetic unit. This uses the integer arithmetic unit. Okay. Now, there can be instructions for increment of a content of a memory or a register, decrement of a content of a memory or register. Okay. These are generally on integer uh, operands. Okay. Then we can have, say, abs for abs determining that absolute value, and we can have negate also 
to take the complement of a integer number okay or the negation negative of the floating point number therefore these are mainly and generally the instruction that are uh, there under the arithmetic group okay now let us come to the third group okay we call it the the logical group okay under this we have the instructions generally like say and or exclusive or okay and these are on bits therefore by that i mean for example say let me explain say and operation okay say this is our and operation say this is operand bit 1 and say this is operand 2 both of them are one bit okay now if it is this operand 1 can be 1 or 0 this also can be 1 or 0 in the case of an and operation that if both operand are 1 then we have 1 here other we have 0 0 and 0 okay therefore when we do that and operation say on two bytes the two bytes will have say one byte contains this data another byte contains say this data say this is my operand 1 and this is my operand 2 then and operation will be performed on bit by bit okay which means the result will be 1 here 0 0 1 here 0 0 1 and 0 this will be of 1 and of 2 okay that will be the operation of of 1 and of 2 okay now similarly in the case of an or operation bit by bit that operations that will take place is that if it's 1 0 1 0 then if any this is operand 1 say this is operand 2 then this will be 1 this will be 1 this will be 1 and this will be 0 that means if both of them are 0 then the result is 0 otherwise the result is 1 and once more it will be operated okay bit by bit for example this is operand 1 and this is operand 2 then the or will be this is 1 this is 0 this is 0 1 okay 1 1 1 and 1 this will be our operand 1 or operand 2 okay this is operand 1 or operand 2 any of them 1 is 1 otherwise it is 0 for example here it is 0 now similarly that exclusive or we can define this way say exclusive or operation will be once more bit by bit say operand 1 here operand 2 here 1 and 0 1 and 0 exclusive or says that if either one of them is 1 then the output is 1 otherwise the output is 0 for example here this is 1 because this is 1 this is 0 and here this is 1 because this is 1 this is 0 and here both of them 1 therefore it is 0 here also both of them are 0 therefore it is 0 that is our exclusive or and once more it will be performed bit by bit okay for example that exclusive or operation of these two will be this is 0 this will be 0 this will be 0 this is also 0 this is 1 because this is 1 this is 0 this will also be 1 okay this is 0 and this is 1 okay this will be our operand 1 XOR operand 2 okay now these are the uh, instructions that uh, generally are there 
for as logical under the logical group. There's few more. For example, compare is a instruction which compares two numbers x and y and accordingly decides which one is greater by appropriately putting the putting a flag bit as we have uh, talked about the flag bits earlier. Then we have that which we have already used in our arithmetic operations, okay. Arithmetic shift right or arithmetic shift left. For example, if we have a number, I'm taking a 4-bit number uh, for our convenience of representation, say 0, 1, 0, 0. The arithmetic shift right, say this is a sign bit, and I'm talking about, say, in terms of 2's complement, right? That arithmetic shift right will be essentially that I shift one position to the right, therefore it will be 0, this will be 0, this will be 1, this will be 0, and the sign bit will be repeated here, okay? That is our arithmetic shift right, which means essentially means that whatever shifting is done, okay, that the sign bit is repeated at the sign bit position. Say if it is a negative number, say 1, 1, 0, 0, if we give a right shift to it, then it will be 0 here, 0 here, 1 here, this is 1 here, and 1 is repeated. This is our arithmetic shift right. Okay. Now, this bit that flows out can be captured in a 1-bit register and can be kept for examination by the CPU once more. Right. Similarly, we can have arithmetic shift left. We can have logical shift right. Okay. This is spelling mistake, shift, logical, shift right, or logical, shift left. In this case, that irrespective of the sign bit, what enters into the most significant bit in the case of a right shift is zeros, okay? We call this as a logical shift right or logical shift left. Okay? Sometimes we can have a so rotate instruction also, say rotate right or rotate left, okay? And that can be either straight or through carry bit, okay? This can also be through carry bit. That way we mean that say for example if we have a data say 1001 zero, zero, one, rotate right means that so rotate right that it will be rotated right and the bit that comes out of the rightmost position enters into the leftmost position. The rotate right of this will be say 0 0 Okay, this one comes here and this one comes here. That is the rotate right of this. Okay, and it is if it is rotate right through carry, right in that case, say if the original is 1001 and we have a carry flag, okay, which was containing say 0, then this one comes into the carry, this 0 comes as the most significant bit and the other bits are shifted to the right, which means the result will be, say, after this rotate right operation, 1, 0, 0, okay, this one comes here and this 0 comes here. Therefore, say this will be the content of this operand and the carry will now contain this one that comes into this location, uh, this from the least significant bit. That is our rotate right operation. Similarly, we can have uh, rotate left, 
and rotate left through caddy. Okay. Now these are our uh, that logical operation, and uh, we can the complement operation. That means. complement we take generally once complement okay it's an operation which is also is grouped under our logical operation group okay which means if we the four bit operand if we have assuming that a four bit operand we have zero one then complement will be zero one one zero okay that will be the complement once complement of the original number. Now, apart from that, uh, we can have few what we call that input output. instructions this is typically for inputting from an input device or outputting into an output device the simple input output instructions can be in that you say in and then give a port number okay or a device number right say we generally call it a port number or out that means output the content of either a memory location or a register to a port number. But the input output for complex devices is a bit more complicated and we will take up that discussion when we discuss that input output devices in our lectures. Okay. Now then let us come to the other operations. There are some system control operation. Okay. We call it system control operation. Now, some of them are say, let me use this enable interrupt, disable interrupt, okay, and wait for interrupt okay this is essentially call it enable this is disable interrupt and this is wait for interrupt. Now, in the first two lectures, we say that when the CPU wants that some I/O devices to work, the CPU need not wait for the I/O devices to complete this operation. What it can do is that it just sets the I/O device into motion, okay, initiating the job, and then it starts doing its own job. When the I/O device has completed the operation the IO device then interrupts the CPU and tells that that job it has been completed then the CPU can do whatever uh, the data that has been supplied by the input device or if uh, it is output device possibly the data has been consumed by the output device and the CPU decides the next course of, act, next course of action. Now uh, the thing is that say the CPU has uh, given a job to be done by say a output device. Okay. Now the CPU may be doing certain very important job and it may not uh, it may not like that the any device or any other uh, person, I mean any other machine, subsystems, etc., uh, interrupts it. In that case, what it can do is that it can disable all interrupts and saying that it does not want that it be interrupted now. And similarly, after disabling interrupt, when the CPU 
finds that can it can once more entertain interrupts, they, then it can enable the interrupt once more. Therefore, you see that this disable interrupt and the enable interrupts are used so to say that whether the CPU wants to be interrupted okay, or can afford to be interrupted or not. If it, the CPU cannot afford to be interrupted, then it says it's disable interrupt or if the CPU can afford to get itself interrupted, then it enables the interrupt. Okay. Now, that is uh, the situation for the enable interrupt and the disable interrupt instructions. We will have some occasions possibly of using these two instructions later on. Okay. Now, wait for interrupt is a situation where say that CPU has given some job to be done by another subsystems or some input output device, but the CPU cannot proceed any further okay, until and unless that job is completed. Okay. For a simple example, say program has given something to read, okay, but the program, the CPU that is executing needs the data immediately before it can proceed once more. Therefore, you can see the CPU cannot proceed once more and therefore CPU has to go to an wait state, okay, executing these instructions that wait, okay. It will now wait till that interrupt comes, okay, and from the input device, the data is that accepted by the CPU and then the CPU can proceed once more, okay. Now, this can be used for waiting keeping the system, keeping the CPU in a wait state. Okay. Once more, we will have some occasions of uh, discussing uh, where if these wait instructions can be fruitfully utilized later on. Now, let us come to another set of instruction which we call that branch group, okay. Now we said that say a CPU is executing an instruction many a times and as we know the CPU executes instructions one by one in a sequential order, right. Now after executing several instruction in a sequential order, the CPU may want to go out of the sequence and start executing some instruction which is away from the normal sequence either in the forward direction or say in some backward direction, okay. For example, the high level statements that we have say if A greater than B, then we do something, else we do something, okay. Now, this is essentially ultimately when it's converted to machine language is equivalent to that branching out from a normal sequence of execution depending upon what is the result of this comparison, okay. Now, sometimes the uh, high level language have a code which says that go to say some level 1 that is an unconditional branch to level 1. Therefore, you see that we can either have a conditional branch or we can have an unconditional branch, okay, from a particular point of execution, okay. Now, uh, we have several instructions to do that. One is a jump instruction. So, for example, if there is a jump instruction, say jump followed by some address say 0, 5, 0, 0, then say this is a jump instruction is here, then on executing this jump instruction, the control will automatically will be jumped to 0500 location if it is here or 0500 location if it is on the lower side of the address space, okay. Now, uh, this is jump. And there can be conditional jumps also. Uh, I hope you remember that say we have few flags, okay, like say carry flag, sign flag, overflow flag, and the 
parity flag, okay, overflow flag and the parity flag that we discussed when we had been discussing that uh, arithmetic that the computer can perform, okay. Now, depending upon the the status of this flag, which can be either 1 or 0, the jump can take place, okay. For example, we can have an instruction say, jump on carry, right, which means that I will jump out provided the carry bit is 1, okay. Similarly, we can say jump on no carry. This we call the conditional branch, okay. Conditional branch instructions. Similarly, we can say jump on sign, jump on no sign or rather jump on sometimes called positive, jump on negative, jump on positive, right. Similarly, we can have jump on overflow, jump on non-overflow, okay, jump on parity, jump on no parity, the parity is even, then we call jump on even parity, and we can call the jump on odd parity, okay. Uh, now, these are the conditional jumps or conditional branches. Jump is an unconditional branch instruction, okay. Now, there are other branch instructions also. For example, we can say instead of a jump, sometimes the, it's called a branch instructions, BRN. How far a jump instruction can take the control depends upon what is the address that I can put on the, along with the jump instruction, okay. That we'll talk when we come to that addressing modes. Now, another um, instruction sometimes are there, we call it a skip instruction. What the skip instruction does is, that so for example, you have the skip instructions here and you have an one instruction here, say for example, this instruction is move register 1 to register 2, then the skip instruction skips the next instruction and continues the execution, the CPU continues execution from the instruction here. That means it skips immediately next instruction and the control comes to the instruction, control comes to the instruction which is next to next. That's called the skip instruction. Now, this branch and skip instruction can be uh, and have to be used whenever you have to uh, control the flow of control of execution of a program, right. Now, as you know that we use that subroutines or the functions, in that case, the control has to flow from one point in one program or one function and goes into the beginning of another function and the control should come back to the point where from where the control flew out, okay. This is called naturally subroutine call or the function call. Correspondingly naturally there should be a machine instruction which should be able, which will be able to handle this and such instruction is called jump to subroutine, okay. We'll discuss the jump to subroutine in our next lecture.